more about it. And um, yeah, yeah, please put your hands together for David. for minimum time, and then the last one is to manage for diversity of plants and animals. And you've heard some, some of the reasons behind that and that uh, Yana experiment is just a, a wonderful video to talk about the power of diversity, uh, where, what's happening down below ground. I want you to focus on the first four. The more you focus on these first four principles in any operation, then other things will follow. And the other way of looking at it is that 
if you don't follow those first four, or if we don't adhere to those principles as best we can in your particular operation, then you'll probably find the system isn't going to function very well at all. So in order of importance, I encourage people to start with this first four. And what we're trying to shift in terms of managing, what we're trying to actually shift is this ecological management model. Now, it's, you'll, you'll see from Charles's talk, um, similar concepts through it. This is the model that we use around it, where in the centre of your ecosystem, you've got carbon, and carbon circulating throughout your um, soil, throughout your plants, throughout your animals. Around that, we've got ecosystem services. And they're the freebies, the bit we don't have to actually pay for. It, it's little, don't, you know, if you, want to, if you don't know what an ecosystem service is, how many people know what an ecosystem service is? A couple of minutes. How many people know them? I'm not going to put your hand up. A few more. No. Um, ecosystem service are those freebies that we get within our systems. It's little things that aren't really important. You know, pollination. We don't need pollination, do we? Uh, filtration of air, giving us oxygen to breathe. Not important. No. Um, temperature regulation, breakdown of material, okay? um, Sir Albert Howard's law of return about how we actually have this constant cycle of organic matter breaking down and birth, growth, reproduction, death and decay. So we're going through the same thing. So that's your ecosystem services. Around that we've then got these four key ecological indicators. Down the bottom here we've got our soil health and this is where your mineral cycle is. This is about how well your soils are actually functioning. And then we've got biodiversity. And those, all of these ones link together. And you think back to Charles's diagram before the arrows going between everything. Everything is absolutely interlinked. You can't have good soil health without having a good degree of diversity. Uh, the better you get your diversity in soil health, the better you're going to get your water cycle. And then we've got energy flow, which is the solar panels. If we have abundance, if we have really good use of ecosystem services, good carbon, good soil health, biodiversity, water cycle, energy flow, the system becomes much more resilient and it can take a whack. And we get these extreme weather events, which we are experiencing, haven't we? You just think about uh, what's happening around Australia at the moment. We've got everything from floods to droughts to fires. You know, what um, my mother mentioned to me in a phone call this morning, she saw a meme or a joke or something, I wish God would stop playing with the remote control. You know, it keeps on changing channels, can't look like work out what he wants to do. We've got a lot of variability. The more resilient your ecosystems are, the better you're going to be able to manage that. So let's talk about managing. This first grazing principle is about planning, monitoring and managing. Um, the first part is about planning and each of these three ones are really important. Having a plan, have a plan, have a plan, have a plan. If you don't have a plan, uh, then you're really getting pushed around by everything else around you. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower you know, said, plans are useless, but planning is everything. And there's that old, other old famous statement about if you, don't, if you um, fail to plan, you plan to fail. Yeah, but it's about that planning process. That's the bit that's really important. Now, the f it's about thinking ahead. And I, I would encourage you, <coughs> I'm assuming that because you're at a grazing forum, most of you are graziers. Is that a bit right? You can say nothing, that's an option as well. But <laughs> just chuck your, chuck your mitts up if you're in grazing. Good, good. Note yourself, don't ask questions, just get your hands up. Um, so I assume that we're being in the grazing business. What I want to challenge you to think about is I want you to approach running your grazing operation the same way as what a pilot would approach going and preparing for a flight. So I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be a, a pilot and fly myself around a bit. Now when I go out on a flight, I've got to do some flight plans. Okay, so I'll go, I'm going to work out where I'm going to go. I'm going to go from point A to point B. And I usually want to make sure that I can get to point B, land safely, with a bit of fuel left in the tanks. Now, I kind of like living. I enjoy what it is that I do. And if I stuff it up, and some of the longest flights I've done would have been Longreach to Alice Springs. Okay? Think about your Australian geography. What's between Longreach and Alice Springs? Sand. You sit there for hours, literally, with sand dunes. You go, underneath you. It's a beautiful flight. But there's a whole lot of nothing. So therefore, this planning component in setting out in that journey is absolutely critical. And I know that if I get it wrong, the consequence of that could be not so good. However, what we see in a lot of grazing industries, grazing businesses, is that you take off on that flight knowing full well there's not enough fuel in the tanks. But it's all right, we'll just get a tanker halfway along. Yeah, we rely on the Air Force to come in and refuel me halfway between Longreach and Alice Springs. 
It doesn't quite happen that way. Why don't we do that in flying? Because we could die. Yeah, but we die over a period of about 25, 30 years in the grazing business. The rate of decay in ecological and financial health, health is very slow. But what if we approached it with a different mindset? And let's get our planning right. Yeah, you jumped the gun on me, Charlie. I won the moves, though. So. Um, but it's about, I want you to think of it from a, pl- a flying point of view. And burying a head in the sands isn't going to change anything. Uh, definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. So if you're not happy with the way things are trending, then we need to do something different. We can't hope for something better. We need to manage for things to be different. What to plan for? Here's just a few things that we've got to think about from a planning point of view. We want to be planning for rest. Okay, what recovery period do we need to be giving our plants? Uh, what graze period are we going to be in there for? Uh, flood mitigation. If you've got country that's flood prone, you obviously don't want to plan to have animals there in a high risk area at that time of year. Matching stocking rate to carrying capacity by paddock with different grass species, different rainfall patterns, um, even with dieback in certain areas, you're going to have very different response rates and therefore different yields in paddocks going, moving forward. And, and that's changing a lot at the moment, isn't it? Individual paddock rests. Uh, the question around introduced versus uh, native species. A lot of our introduced species uh, require different rest periods to some of our natives. And some of our natives need a lot more than some of our introduced. So it's about matching that up in your different paddocks. Having a fire plan. You're making sure that you've actually got a, a plan in place there to reduce your risk to getting burnt out. Grazing to the yards and activities. So I started with, a, with RCS as a client up in North Queensland and our activities up there, our muster for weaning was pretty well just like any other day. Uh, we, we weren't in that situation where we'd go out and take us months to do a round. Um, we had animals fairly well mobbed up so we'd just go and get that mob, graze them to the yards, put them in the yards when the vet was there or when we were weaning and then graze them out again. But we had to plan for that. We also had to plan to have the best paddocks for our heifers to carve out in. You know, and, those of you with different species, you've got to make sure that you've got your animals in the right paddocks at the right period of time to set yourself up for a win. Avoiding seasonal toxicity. So if you've got uh, heart leaf or if anyone's got Georgina Gigi out west there, you don't want to be in, those country, in that country at those times of year where you've got the highest risk. And that's part of your planning as well. Feed budgeting and then your infrastructure. It's about thinking ahead. When you're flying a plane, you don't manage from where you are. You get your head hundreds of miles out in front of where that aircraft is because that's where you stay alive. You don't fly where you are right now. So if you're going out and you're looking to change enterprises, you might have more breeding than you had dry stock, more dry stock. You might be introducing other species. Do you have the fencing and water infrastructure to set yourself up for a win? If not, we probably need to stop doing that one and get the infrastructure before we can bring those animals in. So there's, there's, it's not an extensive list, but there's some of the different things we need to be thinking about to set ourselves up for that win through the year. One of the other things that comes to planning is planning your stock numbers. So if we just run through a little quick example around how to plan ahead. So if we say, I'll just pick, you've got 500 cows, and let's say they're lactating in, uh, in January, about 500 kilo average weight. Now if we think through the year, and this was uh, timing that I used to use up north, 1st of Feb, bulls went in. That's a key, really important part of a breeding operation, isn't it? Making sure they go in. So then your timing of getting that in is critical. 1st of March, let's say we branded and sold the dries, and then we weaned in May. So we go through and do that. And we're going to start carving, if we're putting bulls in Feb, start carving in November. Everybody who's running a breeding operation could list down those key activities. There's nothing there that's, that's new or foreign, and you've all got the skills and experience and knowledge to be able to do that. Even in continuous mating systems. You know, you'll be able to know when you've got those key carving periods to be able to list down. With that then, we can start to consider what your standard animal unit ratings are, or LSU. So if you're running livestock and you're not familiar with LSU tables, I'd strongly encourage you to get exposed to this information. What it works on is that your feed requirements changes depending on the stage of lactation of your breeding animals. So if you've got a dry cow versus a cow in third trimester, her feed demand goes up about 20% when she goes into third trimester. And then her feed demand when she actually calves and starts lactating pretty well doubles from where it was as a dry cow. And you can see there I've got a 500 kilo cow uh, with, the, with the red box around it. So your dry cow has got a, a standard animal unit rating of 1.03 large stock units. Third trimester she goes up to 1.21. And then when she's calved, she's 2.2. And anybody who's rotating breeders, 
you see this, don't you? Okay? As soon as they start carving, the amount of tucker that they're hoovering in the paddocks, just go, it absolutely takes off. And then you see it at the other end. When you actually go through and wean, you really see a big reduction in the amount of feed that they're hoovering once those animals stop lactating. So in terms of us being able to, the principle we're going to come to in a minute, match stocking rate to carrying capacity, it's really important information to keep in mind and actually understand where it is. Um, I just got back from doing a course in Fremantle and there's a bloke there that worked out that he was 50% out on how many animals he actually thought he was running when he went back and applied this. And it completely changes um, the way you look at it. And if we assume that we're going to be carving 50% uh, down in November and the other half in December, so let's just, if you, that's in a two-month carving, then we can start to map this out. And we can do up a diagram just like this. And I had something like this sitting on my office wall um, back when I was still on a property. So if we know that we're going to be half of our animals are carving in November, so there's our dry animals, third trimester wet. So 50% are carving in November. That means the other half are going to be third trimester. And then when we get into December, we're assuming that they are all wet. And then I usually find it's easy to work back from there. If you know that 100% of them are going to be wet in December, then 100% of them are going to be in third trimester in October and September, that last three months of pregnancy. And then when we get back to August, so we go back one, two, three months, half of them are going to be third trimester, and the other half is still going to be dry until they get to third trimester. If they're not lactating, we consider them to be a dry animal. And then just keep working back. And so if we're weaning in May, they're going to be wet from December through to there, and then they become dry. Everyone could do that. And I'd encourage you to start thinking about what that looks like for your property. Your timing will be different. Your percentages will be different. So just got to do that for your property using your knowledge and your experience. Once you've done that, then we can start thinking about what that means from our feed demand. In flying terms, what's our fuel burn going to be like? Okay, so how much fuel do we actually need in the paddocks and the tanks? If we apply an LSU rating of 1, 1 1.2 and 2.2 .2 off those tables, change it. If you've got different weight animals, if you've got bigger cows, so you can obviously have that bigger. Whole separate topic when we get into the size of cows. Um, if you've got uh, yeah, smaller cows, bring that one down. You use those tables. Any of you have done a come, come and done a course with us, it'll be in your manual. You might have just forgotten that it's in there. And this is what it looks like. Now, we can look at it and say, oh, on average, when you work all that out, that particular data there says that you're going to have, for 1,000 cows, an average of 1,611 LSU is what that, what colour is that, orange line is. Now, if you look across 12-month average, that's what it is. But if you're rotating animals around, how many LSU you've got back here when you've got a wet cow is actually 2,200. And then as soon as you wean, they come back to 1,030. And then as they start to come into third trimester, it creeps up and as they calf, your actual feed demand goes up like that. And that's the curve that happens for all of you in any breeding operation. Important stuff to know. Now, it's easy to look and say that's the average, but if you're grazing some country here and some different country there, how much feed they're going to be taking out is going to be dramatically different. And similarly, what they're taking out of paddocks here is very different to what they're going to be taking out there just as they're starting to calve. Now, for most landscapes, when they're doing that is right at the end of your non-growing season before you actually start to get in a heap of feed coming along. So the last thing we want to be doing is running out of feed just as everything's calving when you've got cows and calves running around when your options to move become much more limited. So if we fly this plane a long way out in front and look at what this actually is going to mean, then we can, we can actually put systems in place there to set ourselves up for a win as we move forward. Next thing is about planning your nutritional seasons. And so you can come up with a diagram a bit like this, which is basically for your landscape or landscapes if you've got different systems or different properties, what are your, what's your quality and quantity of feed look like? Now for most northern, it looks something like this. She takes off, goes really high for a while, quality starts to drop off and then we eat all our tucker. So what, what does that mean for you? What's your timing? And I'll come back to the flying analogy. When are you going to get more fuel in your tanks? When are you actually going to get a chance to refuel? Now, if you know you're not going to refuel for a very long time, we need to plan for that. The property I was on, 10-month non-growing was just standard. We had a two-month growing, 10-month non-growing. So we had to think a long way out in front, didn't we? Landscapes in, you know, within a short radius out from Mackay here, 
you're going to have a slightly longer growing season to play with. It's about managing for what is your current reality. And when it comes to rain, and this is an important part of this planning ahead, nutritional seasons, you know, the rainfall is pretty important. So I've got a challenge for you. I came across this early in the year. I think this is good. Next time you're at a barbecue and you think about how do you come up with conversation starting, you're trying to find some common interests and talk with someone, okay? instead of talking about how much rain you've had, tell them that you're a pluviophile. And then try and talk your way out of where their head just went. Because the definition of a pluviophile is, in the dictionary is a lover of rain, someone who finds joy and peace of mind during rainy days. So I think that's everybody in agriculture, isn't it? Yeah. Unless, you're, unless you're in farming and you're about to try and go put a header in. Uh, so there you go. That had not much to do with what I was saying, but I thought it was funny. The reality with rainfall, now this is actually my parents' country out in southwest Queensland. Uh, this is what their rainfall records look like. Just chuck your hands up if your rainfall patterns look similar. Everyone put your hands up. You may not have the same variability, you might have more variability. But if you operate in agriculture in Australia, you have variable rainfall. So that is your reality. You go back and look at your rainfall records for everywhere. That's what you get. And then somewhere in the middle, we've got this thing called median or average rainfall. Now, I believe that median rainfall or average rainfall is a similar to being a mythical creature called a unicorn. Uh, that's between Mitchell and Bollum. But everywhere I go, it doesn't matter where we go, you're going to have a degree of variability. And then in the middle here, we've got average. Now, all averages is, is a period of a, an amount of rainfall that you might get every 7 to 14 years as you're going from dry years to wet years, and you come back down through it again as you're going down to dry years, come back up to wet years. One of the first things we need to plan for is that reality. If we're planning, if your business is only structured to be profitable in an average rainfall year, then in Australia we're actually setting ourselves up to fail because it's structured around a seasonal set of conditions that don't actually exist. The reality is variability. There's a saying that the only constant is change. And that's the same with our rainfall as well. Um, so I stop riding the unicorn. And a lot of us take off hoping... It's a bit like me taking off for a flight and hoping that I'm going to be able to get some fuel about somewhere between Longreach and Alice Springs. You know you're not going to get it, so we need to plan for that. Monitoring. Second part of this first principle is absolutely critical to be thinking ahead and looking at what's actually going on. Um, our power of observation, unfortunately, is pretty poor. Okay? Quite often, we, uh, it's a bit like a magical trick. We've got uh, misdirection and we're looking in the wrong area and we're not looking at what actually truly makes a difference for us. Um, and a lot of observations that unfortunately happens, I think, now is it's done at 80k an hour in a cruiser with the windows wound up and the radio on. And there's this old saying that the best fertiliser you can give your paddocks is two footprints. And I, I think that's absolutely true. I think we need to get better at observing what's happening. Which way is our country trending? Is it trending up or trending down? What's actually going on? What's growing? What's not? What are the animals eating? What are they not eating? What are they chasing? And I think if, you've got to put my, if you put animals into a paddock and they go fighting over a plant, I want you to get in there and fight bloody harder. Go in there and see what they're chasing, because that tells us something about what they need. Some of the things we've got to be monitoring against, there's a bit of a list here, and I'm just, this is just for uh, food for thought for you. Okay, what rest uh, is actually required? Is your stocking rate to carrying capacity right? Is your feed budget right? Do we need to adjust? Yeah, predicting a drought. Unless you have a flood, fire or grasshopper plague come through, you don't run out of feed overnight. It's always a slow event. Okay, so unless you have a fire, a flood, something like that, you don't walk out one morning and go, oh, shit, where'd that go? <laughs> it was all there yesterday, wasn't it? You know, and so it, we do have the ability to be able to foresee it. And we've got, you know, we, we've got tools there that allow us to be able to know that and understand that to think out ahead. And they're pretty powerful. Uh, if you can predict a drought, then you can destock in a timely manner. Uh, the, the drought management exercise we do in the schools. All well, comes back to doing the numbers behind. The earlier that you make a change, the smaller your change needs to be, and usually on a higher market. And consequently, the later it takes you to change, the bigger your reaction's got to be. You've got to sell more animals, usually on a sliding market. Um, so if, you, if you've got animals that you dearly love and you want to hold on to more of them, then the, the ability to feed budget is absolutely critical. Uh, management errors. When we stuff things up, we make mistakes, we'll continue to make mistakes. If you've got some monitoring in place to know what you stuffed up and what caused it, then you might reduce the chance of doing it again next time. 
compare paddock yields and gross margins, being able to actually make economic decisions on treatments and do you do this and <coughs> excuse me, um, what's the profitability from doing multi-species versus um, single crops and grass versus not putting numbers around this stuff. Accurate return on investments and uh, resetting your benchmark and monitoring your land health trends. So there's just some of the things we need to be monitoring for. Key monitoring tools, one of them is a grazing chart. Yeah. If you don't know what a grazing chart is, they're probably one of the most power, power, single most powerful management tools we've got available to us in the grazing industry. They're worth hundreds of thousands of dollars when we fill them in and use them. Fixed point photos. I don't know whether you're aware, but your memory fails you. Your memory plays tricks. Uh, we forget some of the things that we don't want to remember. And we, do, we actually don't like remembering things that were painful. So it's really easy to try and forget that this is what a paddock may have looked like. And as you go through and change your management practices, you want to see this country repairing. So we're talking about, uh, to come back to some of the things Charles was talking about. We've got, um, it, every ecosystem goes through a period of state and transitional successional species. So from bare ground, mother, if you think about mother nature, mother nature hates being nude. She does not do nudity well. Okay? She hates it. She wants to cover herself up. So if you take mother nature back to bare ground, one of the first things she's going to throw up is a pioneer species, which we call weeds. And the reason we usually don't like weeds is because we can't turn them into kilos of beef, which is fair enough. But we've got to ask ourselves the question, why are they growing? What's actually happened there? From weeds, you go into annual grasses, annuals into undesirable perennials, and from desirable perennial, undesirable perennials, you go to desirable perennials. Mother Nature is always trying to take us on that trend. So if you've got species growing, we want to see them coming up. So there's nothing wrong with having some weeds growing where you've got nothing else growing, because that's actually nature's first step. This is all these photos at the end of the dry, and then that's after the end of the wet. Interestingly enough, this property, this is just north of Rockhampton. Uh, they're running three times the different district average carrying capacity. That's one of the key things, some of the photos I'm going to finish with here. Um, I'm not finished yet, so don't get too excited. Um, these changes don't mean that you run less animals than your neighbours. You know, these changes are about making sure that you actually increase carrying capacity. Because if you've got more grass than what your neighbours do, that means you're going to have increased potential to run animals. And these guys are running three times what everyone else around them is doing, and that's what they've done with their country through that time frame. I think that's pretty exciting. I know it excites the hell out of me seeing it happen. Managing. So we had a plan. We've monitored against what's actually going on. The next step now is to um, adjust to your current reality. In flying terms, you take off and set off flying, you don't know what the weather's going to be doing. You don't know where the winds are going to be coming from, so you're constantly having to manage. Otherwise, you might end up in a completely wrong destination. You don't know what your weather's going to do. You don't know if it's going to be a really harsh winter, really wet winter, when the season's going to break. So you monitor against that and adjust accordingly. Put yourself in control. So if we think about come back to unicorn rainfall again. Now, the reality is you've got this blue line rainfall, haven't you? That's what you actually experience, not that. So... Deal with what you actually have and plan ahead, not with what you hope to have or thought that you should have at. Does that make sense? Okay, deal with what you've actually got. If you always manage for what you've actually got, then you're setting yourself up for a win. If you're wishing and hoping and praying for something that you don't have, then you're not actually in control of your business. You're relying on an external influence. And so if you're just dealing on hope and prayers, and hope is not a strategy. Now, this is what we set out and think. So when you do a plan, you might know you want to go from point A to point B. <laughs> we monitor and then reality kicks in and this is what your journey more than often looks like. That's real, isn't it? Yeah? There's nothing here that I'm saying that you wouldn't know. Yeah, this makes sense. But we've got to be able to adjust as we go through. If you don't make changes, if you don't adjust, then you might not actually get out of that ravine. So with management, if we look at roadsides there, if that's what country is looking like under no management then what's happening on the other side of the fence, I would say, is actually mismanagement. And I used to say that your country should look as good as your roadsides. And uh, Shane Joyce, one of our clients down at Theodore, he said, that's bullshit, David. Yeah. He said, your country should look better than your roadsides because you're managing it. And I'm glad he said that to me about 12 years ago. I haven't forgotten that. This next principle is about plants need adequate rest. Okay? Plants needing adequate rest. And there's a couple of different parts to it. Some of you have already been exposed to it. The most important thing with understanding plant rest and recovery is this model here, these three stages of growth. 
And it all started right back with the bloke who did research on corn plants and then worked out that annuals and perennials actually behave in a lot of similar ways. So we've got three phases of growth here through time. In the first phase, you've got slow growth through time. Phase two, you've got fast growth and the root systems go down. Then your plants set up maximum root um, uh, activity, secondary roots. And then you've got high quality and your root mass actually comes back. So plant roots, I think of them like being a muscle. Uh, if, you've got, um, if you want to build muscle, if you want to go and do weightlifting at, um, at the Olympics or something like that, what you do is you go and lift heavy weights, which tears muscle fibres, and then you rest. And they say, you tear fibres, rest, tear fibres, rest. So work out, rest, work, rest. And that's what actually builds strength. Now, if you break your arm or a leg, what happens to your muscles? Now, your muscles waste away, don't they? You get muscle atrophy. Now, plants have a similar thing going on with them. If you're not using your root systems, if you've got an old rank plant over here in phase three, your root systems are no longer active. So your, active root, uh, your root activity comes back up to nothing. So if you go up to a spear grass plant or something like that that's in a roadside that hasn't been burnt, cut, slashed, grazed, anything for ages, and you go and grab it, usually what you find is you go and it just pops out because the root activity is only really shallow. But you go and try and pull out a plant that's been grazed. Uh, you'll throw a disc out sometimes trying to pull them out because they've got this active depth of root systems underneath. Your feed quality, phase one tucker, it's short but, and, and it's not much of it, but it's bloody good quality. So your quality is really high. Through phase two, your feed quality remains pretty good and starts to drop off. By the time you get to the end of phase three, it's back down here, which is caused by, in perennial grasses primarily, which most of you are going to be playing with, an increase in lignin which makes your grasses rank, okay? Increase in lignin, drop in digestibility. Drop in digestibility, drop in rate of passage. Drop in rate of passage, drop in intake. Drop in intake, drop in productivity. Drop in productivity, drop in gross margins, drop in gross margins, drop in profit. So phase three grass uh, has a big impact on feed. And when you see poo starting to pile up, that's an indication of they're eating phase three tucker. So from a grazing in terms of giving our plants adequate rest, our goal is, as best we can, to have more phase two leaf than phase three, which we've got a heap of, but the quality's no good and the roots activity's no good. Or phase one, where the quality's good, but we just don't actually have bulk. And we don't have carrying capacity as a result. I've got a question for you. Some of you would have had to be to do with photocropping. Would you go and plant a photocrop, sorghum roads or something like that, and leave the cattle in that paddock to wait for the crop to come up? Yes? No? No. No. It's a bloody stupid idea, isn't it? Hey, we wouldn't even think about doing that. Dick O'Connell, one of our clients out at Eulo in southwest Queensland, he said that not resting paddocks is just as stupid as planting a fodder crop and leaving the cattle in to wait for it to come up. Because we've got different age groups of plants. Every year you're going to have new germination of new plants coming through, new perennials, new annuals, everything coming up. If the animals are in to wait to come up, those new germinations, the new generations of plants never actually get a chance to establish. So rest is a really powerful tool to shift our landscapes. And I just want you to remember that impact of root systems there. So let's think about root systems and what benefits they actually provide. Only little ones. If you get increase in root systems, you get more organic matter, soil organic matter, soil organic carbon, and you get an increase in humus. Now, a 1% shift in soil organic carbon is 144,000 litres of water per hectare, extra moisture available to us, as Charles put up there before. It's a huge difference, isn't it? We can't control how much rain we get, but what we can control is how ready we are to receive that. Temperature buffer. You know, and, um, Charles put up that, that data from Gay Brown that a 17 degrees difference in soil temperature, I think that went from 100% efficacy of being able to use moisture to, I think it was 40%, something like that. You know, as your soil temperatures get high, you lose so much more moisture to evaporation. Uh, property I was on at Roma last year, I'm mucking around with the soil temperature, and we had a 17 degrees difference from about me to the podium in underneath a grass plant to bare ground. Yeah. So think about what's happening with this moisture that we are getting. Water infiltration and retention. The key thing to get moisture into your country is active, deep root systems. And the more root systems you've got, so more than 90% of your organic matter, increasing organic matter, comes from root systems and soil biology. More than 90%. So if we want to increase organic matter, we need root systems. 
The more root systems you've got, the more moisture you get in. The increase in the, re- in the infiltration, and uh, Charlie had set up nicely, there were some of those numbers before, going from, what was it, one inch in an hour through to an inch in seven seconds in the rate of infiltration. Aeration. Good soil is made up of half nothing. Okay? I like to keep things really simple. A good soil is made up of half nothing. So if we've got half nothing in the soil, then we've got poor space for moisture and air to get in there. And air is more than 70% nitrogen. So we've actually got this, I think it's about 78 to 80,000 tonnes of nitrogen per hectare circulating in the atmosphere above us. We've got a big fertiliser bag up there. Increase in soil microbes and biological activity, which increases nutrient availability. And uh, Charles talked about that there before. The plants feed the bugs and the bugs feed the plants. Okay? Your bacterial and fungi particular activity down below ground has an enormous impact on the ability of a plant to get access to nutrients. If you don't have any biological activity, then your access to nutrients is purely limited to what the roots touch on the soil, which isn't much. When you think of... Um, yeah, Christine Jones talked about getting a two metre by one metre on healthy soil and going down 10 centimetres, the fungal hyphae, the fungal highways in there, is there's enough there to go around the equator in a healthy soil. Two metres by one metre, 10 centimetres deep. And that's what's happening in access to nutrients when we've got good microbial activity. Increase in store stability, we all know that. Where you've got root systems, you don't get the erosion. Longer growing seasons. If you've got more moisture going in, being held onto, and you've got a better temperature buffer and better nutrient supply, you're going to get longer growing seasons. Maybe not coming into winter, but coming out of winter. That's when you really see things far away a lot quicker. Which increases your resilience, which increases your production, which increases profitability. I try and keep things pretty simple. Every single thing that we want to achieve in your businesses usually comes back to an increase in root activity and mass. Everything that we want to achieve, everything, if we look at um, from a natural resource management issue, if we're going to be correcting a lot of our NRM issues, it, it all comes back to an increase in um, root activity. If we're going to have less of an impact on the Great Barrier Reef, it comes back to more root activity, which just happens to make us more money at the same time. If we're going to lift, shift any of these ecological indicators here, it comes back to deeper, healthier, more perennial root systems. So I just want to put that back up again. We might want more root systems. How we actually go about doing that comes back to the bit we can control is the four-legged tools that we've got. Okay? How we use our animals and where we use them. And uh, Charlie talked about this a bit before, r- impact of grazing on plant root growth. Up to 50% no impact. By the time you've taken out 80% of a plant, you've completely stopped root activity. And hopefully by now you're remembering roots are kind of important. So here's three plants dug up on the same day um, out near Jeringa. These two were 10 metres apart. The only difference is that a fence had been put up 18 months before that and the management was using different systems behind that. So they'd had an uh, inch and a half of rain in August and this was in November. So that plant there is phase two, primed, ready to go. It's going to explode. This one here, it's your gym junkie that never has a rest day. So if you overwork your muscles, you actually end up reducing muscle mass. So you've got to actually make sure that you in, um, stress of muscle, then rest it. Stress, rust. Gym junkie, overworked, no root system. This is your couch potato. This one over here actually hasn't gone and done anything from an um, exercise point of view at all. And so no muscle activity there. Um, never rested, over-rested. And this one here, rest was adjusted to suit the growth rate of the plant. So that when the plants were growing faster, they were allowing shorter recovery periods because it was getting up to top of phase two quicker. When the r- rate of growth slowed down, then they lengthened out the rest period to look after the plant so it was ready to explode. And that's the key thing behind this whole principle, is working with your plants. Principle three is about mo- matching your stocking rate to your carrying capacity. First thing we need to do is actually clarify the definition between these two things because they quite often get um, interchanged. Uh, as an industry, I'm not going to ask you because you're pretty non-responsive, um, how are we going at an, as an industry in the grazing sector around Australia at matching stocking rate to carrying capacity? Bloody ordinary, shit, thumbs down. I'm just repeating what they said. 
uh, we're not doing a great job. A lot of it is because we actually don't have the skills. I think if you're here today, your passion for the land is going to be enormous and you, your um, love for the land and the love for wanting to create good outcomes will be enormous. I don't think many people set out to deliberately not match docking rate to carrying capacity. It might just be they don't have the skills or confidence to be able to do that. If we think about what carrying capacity is, carrying capacity is a measure of what grows up from below in response to moisture and what time of year you got the moisture. Stocking rate is what we put down from above. And we measure that, at, as we talked about before, in large stock units because it changes through the year with size of animals and everything around that. Step one, if we're going to match stocking rate to carrying capacity. Okay? Step one, the most important thing, in my opinion, that we need to do to match stocking rate to carrying capacity is stop riding the bloody unicorn. Because whilst we're riding the unicorn, we're setting out with an expectation, oh, if I can just get a couple of normal years, I'll get back on track. I'll just get a couple of average years. And your neighbours will be saying this all the time. You won't be, I know. Yeah, your neighbours sit there, if I can just get a couple of average years, I'll be all right. A couple of normal years, I'll get back on track. The reality is normal years don't exist. Okay? The reality is that we get wet years, dry years, and every now and then we might get this thing we call normal. And we go, God, shit, thank Christ for that and back. It doesn't work like that. So if you want to match docking rate to current capacity, we need to shift this bit of mushy stuff in here to accept that variability is normal and then design your businesses around that to be able to cater for it. If you don't know how to do that, that's okay. But it's bloody exciting when you do wrap your head around it. This ability to match docking rate to carrying capacity. So this middle arrow is what we're chasing here. We want to have an equal amount of pressure coming down as to what's coming up from below. It's uneconomical to be over here. And I could probably sit here and talk for the rest of the day on some of the costs and some of the modelling and business analysis I've done with this with clients right around Australia. It's also uneconomical to be over here because we're missing out on opportunities to turn grass into money. Now, when you get those good seasons, we need to be actually capitalising off those and increasing profitability to help us actually be able to ride out the next period of droughts we go through, because we know they're real. How do we do it? How do we actually get good at this? And Peter Drucker made this statement that uh, you can't manage what you can't measure. You all heard that before? What are you in the business of doing? If you're in the grazing industry, what are you in the business of producing? Beef. And that's the bit we're really passionate about. We love being beef producers. I'd like to challenge you to shift your uh, approach a touch to say that you're actually grass farmers. Because unless you're in the feedlot industry, you can't produce a single kilo of beef unless you've got grass. So there's a few different stages we're looking at. St step one for you is to convert rainfall into grass. Then we turn grass into protein. And then we turn protein into money. You're actually wearing a few different hats and um, how you do that successfully is going to depend on you and your operation and where you're at. So I want to challenge you to think about from, first of all, your grass farmers. Now, if you're in the business of growing grass, if we make that assumption for a minute, and we take Peter Drucker's thing here to be true, that you can't manage what you don't measure, then we probably need to do a better job at measuring our grass. Grazing charts, these tools I talked about there before, probably one of the single most valuable monitoring, managing, decision-making tools that we think we've ever come with. They are bloody powerful and they're worth anywhere from $25,000 a year to $400,000 a year when you fill them in and use them. Um, and that's not just me sitting here saying those numbers, that's client feedback. And the clients that are using them in the room here at the moment are nodding. If you can't see that, they agree with it. Uh, they're bloody powerful. You need a bit of information around what cattle you've got, and that's the bit that usually stops everyone, is they don't have good enough stock information. Um, when you've got good stock information, filling in a grazing chart and using that to make really good decisions becomes really easy. If you don't have good stock records, then filling it in is really hard. It also happens that if you don't have good stock records, that doing business analysis is really hard. Working out your cost of production is really hard being able to do enterprise analysis to work out which enterprises are making you money and which ones are losing you money becomes really hard. So it all links back, if you think back to that three-legged pot before, it all links back together. So keeping good stock records is quite often one of the first things we do going and working with people before we even worry about grazing charts. Let's just focus on how you keep records and stop keeping the records that you're not using to make decisions. They're just a waste of bloody time. Make sure you keep them the right stuff. The unit of measurement is that we use a stock day's per hectare, okay? 
basically what one LSU eats in one day, we call it stock day. And it's about a measurement of feed. So if, can you just hold up that um, bag for me there, please? So you think about that's a, if you got that bag and you stuffed it full of grass, that's going to be a certain amount of feed, isn't it? Now, what one LSU eats in one day is a certain amount of feed. So it actually enables us to standardise our feed measurement. Thank you. Um, I reckon this is probably one of the single most powerful things that I learnt. One of, I've learnt a few really exciting things. And I grew up on Mulga country. And if you're familiar with Mulga country, when you run out of grass, then you sit on a dozer and just start pulling or pushing or cutting Mulga. Not what I look back on as some of my fondest memories. You know, spending months to years sitting on a dozer, trying to keep animals alive that actually probably wanted to die. Then to go up and learn how to feed budget and to know, and in, for us up north there, to know in 10 months' time my country wasn't going to be in good nick, my cattle were going to be in good nick and I had room to move, that de-stresses a business enormously. That really takes stress out of a business and it puts us in control. It also happens that it's worth, in that case there, it was worth millions of dollars for us because we could match stocking rate to carrying capacity. When we get this wrong, if you're going there and you're sitting there and you're under the fence trying to go and chase a bit of tucker, and I love that photo of Fred Prevenza that I've heard of before, a mistake can cost you a lot of money. And it's quite often you don't feel like it's short term, you will be later. Principle number four is to manage your livestock effectively. Now you might think, why are we talking about livestock and regenerative grazing? It's the, one of the second legs of the pot, isn't it? If your animals aren't producing, you're not going to get enough income. You're not going to get enough income, you're not going to be profitable. If you're not going to be viable, then you're probably going to push your country harder than um, you want to in the first place. So this principle is all about everything that impacts on animal performance. So let's just go through some of them just and not going to talk about it. I know Felicity is going to be talking about uh, nutrition later on. So nutrition is a really important aspect of animal performance, isn't it? Water, quality and quantity. There's a direct link between feed intake and water intake. If animals aren't drinking enough good quality clean water, they won't eat as much. Won't eat as much, they don't get the energy intake. Don't get the energy intake, don't get the performance. So if we're asking animals to drink out of muddy little cesspits, we can't ask them to perform at the same time. That's being unfair on them. Distance walk to feed. Uh, animals walk a long way to get a drink. They just don't want to have to walk far to get a feed. Okay, so they'll do it. And I've seen in the Territory cattle walking 32 kilometres to get a drink and go and get feed. What do you reckon that looked like? Okay, they're in slightly less condition than me, that's for sure. Animal health. If you've got animal health issues, diseases or parasites, then um, that's going to impact performance. So we need to be on top of those and have strategies around each of those. Timing of reproduction. Are you working in sync with nature or are you working out of sync with nature? Your cows are going to reach peak lactation six to eight weeks after calving. At peak lactation, they've got peak nutritional demand. That's when they're asking the most from their country. So when are you reaching peak lactation? Does that line up with the majority of years where your country is providing the most? Because if it's not, then you're actually going to be um, making it really hard and probably having to bring in other sorts of feed to get the condition on your cows to get reconception. So timing. And grazing management, these principles we're talking about. Actually, having stocking rate matched to carrying capacity, we get it wrong, it costs us performance. Uh, the longer animals spend in a paddock, they, they start to decline in feed quality if you're spending long periods of time in paddock. So shorter grazes, higher performance. Rest periods. Overrest our country, poor quality, more lignin. Underrest it, poor, quant poor quantity, we just don't have enough. Utilisation rate too high, going and taking out too much in one hit, which not only impacts root growth, it actually impacts on animal performance. And there's plenty of trial work done on that. And uh, residual dry matter too low, just taking too much out of our country. Uh, not only does it affect your country's ability to respond and utilise moisture and everything like that, it affects the ability of your animals to be able to perform as well. Uh, dry matter. DM is dry matter. So the total amount of feed that we've got left in the paddocks. And then animal behaviour. Um, I personally feel as though we're leaving millions of dollars on the table every year in the, in the livestock sector through poor animal behaviour. So, you know, low-stress dock handling techniques and actually getting animals bomb-proof and teaching them to handle pressure means higher performance, less impact on infrastructure. Uh, we, you know, I'll get them a bandwagon for a minute on this one. You know, we, go, we always go looking for small wins, don't we? We want new technology, those things that's going to really help our business to perform. If we just do the stuff that we know works now, that has a massive impact. We're not doing what we know. If we get better at doing what we actually know works now, and then worry about the bits we don't know. And stock handling, and I, 
I can't state how big an impact that has if it's not right now. Principle five is about high density for minimum time and it's using the hooves and controlling the mouths. Hooves are an amazing tool for regenerating landscapes. Mouths can do a hell of a lot of damage when they're left there too long. So it's the mouths that actually damage stuff, not the hooves. Um, some of the main things we see is better utilisation or even utilisation. You start to see get animal impact and breaking up any crusting that might be going on your soil surface. And when you go into high density systems, you'll find that animals will browse more. So browse is eating trees and shrubs and things like that, as opposed to graze, which is grasses. So high density, uh, everybody that I've talked about that done this, uh, observes an increase in the browse component of the diet, which can lift up the apron under suckers and things like that and allow a bit more sun in and allow a bit more grass to come up. You also see this less patch grazing, which is phase one and phase three grasses, which is a function of low density. Animals going in and eating the ice cream plants first. So just smashing those ice cream plants, the ones that taste the nicest and taste really good. And unfortunately, they graze them down to phase one. And the ones that they don't like as much, they go to phase three. And it's not until they can't wrap their tongues around the phase one stuff, the ice cream stuff, that they go starting to chase the phase three stuff. And so you see that. You, this is right around Australia um, under low density. And for a lot of you, I'm assuming some of you are running pretty extensive operations, you may never stop this, but it's about being aware of that and making sure that we're allowing these ice cream plants here to have a chance to recover. And there's just a really typical photo that you see with low density grazing. So we want to make sure that these guys here aren't grazed out because in behind that we've got weeds and bare ground. And this is when you get to high density, you change the mineral cycle. When you get up over about 60 head per hectare in cattle, the concentration of dung and urine really kicks your mineral cycle into gear, thinking about soil health. And uh, you know, this is the way that nature has actually been built on over the years, has been using this. I also think if you're going to fertilise your veggie garden, how many of you are going to get one cow pat and put it in the middle of the veggie garden going, good, job's done? <laughs> we don't, do we? We spread it evenly. And that's what density actually enables us to do on our landscapes. However, if you remember right back at the start, I said to focus on the first four first. If you don't have the first four, first, first four principles working for you, then I'd be really careful playing with high density. Principle six is a diversity of plants and animals. So here we've got... Uh, a couple of photos that some might be yeah, yeah, it's a bit familiar to some of you. Where's the grass growing? This is on property I was on in Richmond. We grew our best grass in underneath trees. One small caveat. That only worked when we rested the country to allow the grass to grow. If we're not actually allowing rest, usually because of your nutrient cycle, the leaf fall off these plants here is what transforms the nutrients in the soil, in your soil health. So the higher you've got, your, the more leaf fall and nutrient cycle you've got under there, the better the soil is underneath those trees. Now quite often animals will go and camp underneath trees and everything as well, so you might get a bit of extra dung, urine sitting in there. When it's allowed to grow, you'll quite often get your best grass. There's very few species around Australia where that isn't the case, where we're allowed to grow. Now there's a limit. You know, in terms of canopy cover, about at what point in time we actually got too much shading. However, I reckon it's a long way away from where we thought it was. I still maintain on average probably 20 to 30% canopy cover is about ideal, uh, but maybe it's higher. So this is the power of grazing charts, being able to actually measure yields from paddocks. So this is at um, Duke's Plains at Theodore. 16 years worth of grazing charts, which is measuring the actual yield taken out of the paddocks each year for 16 years. And this is measured by the animals. This isn't us doing a subjective measurement. It's actually how many stock days per hectare have we actually removed. And that's what I love about SDHs is, is that the animals calibrate everything for us. They worked out that the stuff that they didn't re-blade plough, they are growing an average of 225 stock days per hectare, which is about a beast to one and a half hectares on average for 12 months. The stuff that they re-blade ploughed, they're only yielding 166 SDHs. So even if you don't understand what it means, that's a lower number than that, isn't it? So therefore, less canopy cover in this case actually resulted in less yield. The eucalypt with 95% canopy cover, they were growing beautiful tucker right in through that. And the softwood scrub was performing really well. 
So Shane went through and worked out that the bit that kicked him in the guts and he really didn't enjoy the analysis that happened around this is it actually cost him $342 per hectare over the 16 years through lost production because he blade ploughed again. And I'm not saying don't blade plough. Please don't interpret that as being the outcome. The thing is that he had the data to show that in his case there, what was working, what wasn't. And that's all we can ask ourselves. What's working, what's not. At the moment, we're making all our decisions usually off gut instinct. The other key thing with it is we need to shift our attitude around biodiversity and tree cover, as the topic we're talking about here, is separate grazing management from the tree effect. In a continuous grazing operation, where plants are continuously exposed to animals, it's a bit like planting that fodder crop, putting the cattle in there, waiting for it to come up. That's what's happening under the trees. If we're going to impact and ask what impact trees are having, then we need to ask what impact are the animals having in that situation as well. Are we allowing the grass to grow? Or are we noticing that grass isn't growing and blaming the trees? And a client who used to be our dinge in Sydney goes, you know, Dave, it took me a bloody long time to work out that it wasn't the trees that were eating my grass. <laughs> so if we're going to implement these, let's just go through some quick photos before um, Julia cracks me off. So this is a barrella bar, and you're asking for about species diversity uh, and asking about weeds. So using state and transition. So that's 1996, that one, was it? That was, not, that was 95, sorry. That's 96. And all they've done here is changed their management of the country. There's no seed planting, there's no fertiliser, no chem. All they've done is change grazing management. And you can see here starting to get galve burr coming up, which is one of the forms of weed. Most weeds have only got, I don't know who asked the question, sir. Most weeds have only got a, a um, well, tap-rooted forbs, which we call weeds, have only got a lifespan of about six to eight weeks. So they're actually quite short-lived. Through the years there, this is where it got to. And then by 2002, so that was a seven year time frame to get there, the bluegrass actually outcompeted the buffalo in the end. And I just think, don't worry about what you've got, manage what you have. If you've got introduced species, great, manage them so they're healthy. If you've got native, manage them so they're healthy. Manage what you actually have. This is a client out at Mitchell. That's one neighbour looking out into his paddock versus out into his neighbours. That's his other neighbour, Northern, and that's looking back into the paddock. These are all taken same day. And that's his third neighbour. Now, he's running a lot more stock than these guys for obvious reasons now, isn't he? But he had to make some big decisions to get to that point. It's also no coincidence that he's bought out two of his neighbours now. This is down at Brewarina. That year there actually had more rainfall than that year there. So it wasn't a lack of moisture, it was a lack of water cycle and root systems that created the difference through the years. This is Cole Sice's place. You've already seen some photos in there. And I just want to look at the difference in the colour of the soil. That's organic matter, which gives you water infiltration, da, 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 and everything flows from that. That's soil health. This is at Bingra. So that's looking out in the two paddocks there, and that's the difference in the colour of the soil underneath. And the soil's dug up the same day. All it is is a difference in management. So we've got a lot of ability to spiral up our country and actually make it more healthy. Now, talking about weeds... This is at um, Casillas in New South Wales. This particular paddock here had been sprayed every year for 13 years to get rid of Patterson's Curse. Pretty healthy crop of paddos. Mike Parrish went in and changed the grazing management, actually started to focus on having healthy grass plants that were there trying to grow, and in one year created a situation when Mother Nature said, I don't need Patterson's Curse to grow anymore. And that's the difference in the psyche, that's the difference in approach. It's not that getting rid of weeds, you can, rather than getting rid of weeds, let's outcompete them with something that's better. And also happens that the things that are better that outcompete weeds are the things that we produce a hell of a lot more kilos of beef on as well. Now the last property, and you can see here, this paddock on the left here had actually been destocked for 12 months, they'd run out of water. So it had been completely destocked. The one on the right had been grazed on and off, um, using time control grazing for the whole time. And the biology is actually starting to go through the fence and increase the level of productivity. And that's, that's root systems feeding the bugs, bugs feeding the plants, and the biology starting to go through. And again, that's 100% rest for 12 months. Now, this is their boundary photo. This is July 2018. So this is Andrew and Katie Zerner at Mergen, and that was the neighbour. 29th of October, they had good rain. Just look at the difference in the volume of feed that responded from that rainfall event. This was 18th of January. They'd only had 10 mils of rain since December. So they had that good October rain and that was about it. A lot of people down there know that. But that was what the country looked like. Now, I was there a little while ago. 
So this is 16th of March, Saturday, 16th of March, only a couple of weeks ago. And that was the way the country was left. But they just had 74 mils as this photo was taken. And you can see those black bits there. And you see those big black bits there. So that country was still stocked. It still had animals in there. So they were in there waiting for the grass to come up. And you can see where the hoof prints were. Now, I've asked Andrew to send me some photos. That was three days. So that's zero. That's plus three days. And then I just got this one. This is Monday this week. That's six days. So that's nine days after the rain. Which side do we want to be on? And management. He, the other thing I do need to say is that he's been averaging running two to three times the number of cattle per hectare to what the, paddock, the property on the right has been. He's also been going through and gradually buying out neighbours. It all links up. There's this, we've got to balance this three-legged pot. I think our focus needs to be increasing carrying capacity, quality and quantity of tucker that we've got. And then match stocking rate to carrying capacity. Stock your country with the animals that pay you the most for your grass. Maximise your gross margin per yellow shoe with enterprises that suit you, your passions, your attitude your can and your country. Do that while we're at running at optimal levels of overheads okay, and um, best rate interest rates you can get and then keep communicating with the people. You're going to have a beautifully balanced three-legged pot. Ignore any of those and you're going to have a three-legged pot which is going to topple because one of the legs is going to be too short and usually what falls out is people and money. Thank you. I'm out of time now. Questions? We've got, two, we've got time for two more questions. So if, if you've got a burning question, please ask it now. Okay, we better move on because we lost a little bit of time over lunch. Thank you very much, David. That was excellent. Um, Jay, really... I've got a question over here. There's one question okay, there's one question. Yep, so I'll leave you to it. Here, uh, yes, uh, you were saying about the tree cover. Yes. Now, you reckon probably around 20 to 30% tree cover is adequate enough? Um, it's on. Um, longer term, we think that that's been in about the range. It completely depends on the plant communities that are there. So I think in certain plant communities, you can go much higher than that. So I, I don't... The message for me is I don't think there's a blanket rule. I probably regret even putting a percentage on it right about now. Uh, I, I don't know there's a blanket rule. It's about use your grazing charts to tell you when your canopy cover is starting to impact on, gra on grass growth. But different plant communities will have different levels that they can actually support and underneath. It also depends on your grass species. Has he clarified it for you? Yep. Okay. Um, I can't see any other hands up. So there's one last one. Okay. Yep. What I usually find is that as you get your... We go back and think about balancing out this pot. Could we go in... And it costs a lot of money. Just ask Charlie, I'm sure. It costs a lot of money to go and plant trees. And I think there's no point going and planting a heap of trees if it's going to make you unviable. Usually, when you get your grazing management and your soil health right, even in Downs country up, to, up north there, we've seen a lot more recruitment of young plants, young trees coming through. Um, I think you guys have found that as well, Garland and Jamie. So in most extensive grazing operations, it's, it tends to be uneconomical to go and spend a lot of money trying to put a lot in. But as we manage for the country and manage for good soil health, the bit we can control is we manage the grass we can see above ground, which promotes root activity that we can't see below ground, which starts to get that ecosystem functioning, by which we'll usually see, if it's the right thing to do for that country, more timber starting to come up. And vice versa too, if you've got too much timber, a lot of the, a lot of the species that we have are actually legumes, so they're, they're trying to be um, soil repairers themselves. So wattle, you see wattle dying out on the front as grass starts to outcompete it. it. Takes time to get there. Sometimes we, we're too impatient and need to make money out of it. Thank you, David. 